We know Benjamin Franklin as a journalist, statesman, inventor, and scientist. Franklin also wrote at some length on political economy. What is seldom discussed is the influence on Franklin's ideas by the small group of French political economists known as the physiocrats. One would not be exaggerating too much to say that to the people of British North America, or Britain itself and even in France, the four decades beginning in 1750 became the age of Franklin. Few men of his time were as well known or well respected as Benjamin Franklin. Few men played a greater part in the major events of the period. Franklin was born on the 17th of January, 1706 in Boston. After just a few years of formal schooling, he was apprenticed to his older brother James, a printer. Of his early years, he later wrote, I was put to the grammar school at eight years of age, my father intending to devote me as the tithe of his sons to the service of the church. My early readiness in learning to read, which must have been very early as I do not remember when I could not read, and the opinion of all his friends that I should certainly make a good scholar encouraged him in this purpose of his. His brother James had completed his own apprenticeship in London and wanted to start a newspaper. He was eventually hired as manager of the New England Current, a paper founded by opponents of inoculation against smallpox. Franklin read everything he could and worked diligently to improve his vocabulary and writing style. One book he studied thoroughly was John Locke's Essay Concerning Human Understanding. Franklin biographer Bernard Fay writes, Franklin, provided with a few books, had been able to create practical and unforgettable formulas which he used to infinite profit during his whole life and in the midst of a century which pushed intellectual and sentimental refinement to such extremes. Benjamin was also drawn to the writings of the leading deists of the day. He stopped attending church services, preferring to spend the time reading and studying. He anonymously submitted letters to his brother's newspaper by sliding them under the door, signing them, Mrs. Silence Duguid. In July of 1723, Franklin quietly left Boston without a word to anyone. He stopped in New York City briefly, but could not find work and continued south to Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, he began working in a printer shop. Soon after his arrival in Philadelphia, the governor, Sir William Keith, called on Benjamin and a friendship developed. Governor Keith urged Benjamin to advance his training in London, and he promised to provide Benjamin with letters of introduction. Unfortunately, the governor was deep in debt on both sides of the Atlantic and in disfavor with the Penn family. Thus, when Franklin arrived in London, he soon found out he was on his own. While in London, Benjamin wrote an essay, a dissertation on liberty and necessity, pleasure and pain, which he had printed at his own expense and gave copies to anyone who agreed to read it and engage him in discussion on the questions raised. Out of this effort, Franklin became friends with one Dr. Lyon, who brought Franklin into what Franklin biographer Bernard Fay described as that curious intellectual society of brilliant, dissolute men who met in the shadowy taverns and who sometimes slipped into the salons of the great. He also befriended Sir Hans Sloan, president of the English Royal Society of Arts and Sciences. In 1726, Franklin accepted the position of clerk to a Philadelphia merchant and returned from London. His new employer soon died, victim of an epidemic that swept through Philadelphia. 
focused on self-improvement, Benjamin started the Junto, a discussion group formed, as he said, to give mutual aid and protection. Benjamin and a friend decided to start their own newspaper and eventually purchased the Pennsylvania Gazette. Coinage, hard money, was in short supply at the time, which prompted Benjamin to write a pamphlet titled A Modest Inquiry into the Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency. In it, he argued, the riches of a country are to be valued by the quantity of labor its inhabitants are able to purchase. To facilitate growth, he concluded that a significant issuance of paper currency would beneficially raise land values and wages. These policy options were controversial then as they are today. In response, the Pennsylvania Assembly decided to issue paper currency, which actually spurred the colonial economy and added to Franklin's reputation. Franklin's next important community project was the founding of the Library Company of Philadelphia. Begun in 1731, the library contained many volumes and had over 50 dues-paying members. In 1734, Franklin became Grand Master of Philadelphia Freemasons. He first joined the Freemasons in 1731, an association that opened doors for him later when he journeyed to France. As biographer Carl Van Doren wrote, In France, Freemasonry was free thinking and opposed to absolution. The Masons of the most eminent lodge in France became his informal colleagues in the service of the new republic. Franklin was just 24. In 1743, Franklin promoted the formation of an American Philosophical Society. He saw the time as ripe, observing, There are many in every province and circumstances that set them at ease and afford leisure to cultivate the finer arts and improve the common stock of knowledge. Another of Benjamin's growing interests was in the ownership and cultivation of land. In 1748, he purchased a 300-acre farm near Burlington, New Jersey. He was determined to apply the most up-to-date scientific methods to agriculture and sought the advice of experts. Not unsurprisingly, he was disheartened that his example was not followed by other landowners in the area. He had already acquired a great interest in the frontier regions, and in 1754 Benjamin wrote a pamphlet titled, A Plan for Settlement of Two Western Colonies in North America. Over the years, he would join others speculating in Ohio lands. Somewhere in this period, he also found time to begin his experiments with electricity, and in 1749 submitted his papers on electricity to the Royal Society in London. These were translated into French and published in France in 1752, after which French scientists repeated his experiments. Reflecting on his life to this point, Franklin wrote to his mother, I enjoy, through mercy, a tolerable share of health. I read a great deal, write a little, do a little business for myself, more for others, retire when I can, and go into company when I please. So the years roll round, and the last will come when I would rather have it said, he lived usefully, than he died rich. Franklin now wrote an essay on population, eventually read by Adam Smith in Scotland. Interestingly, he questioned the wisdom of permitting non-Anglo-Saxons to settle in British North America. He believed that the long-term loyalty of the colonials required the presence of shared cultural and political values with the mother country. He observed that wages tended to be higher in a territory where there was an abundance of free land. 
as he explained. Land being thus plenty in America, and so cheap as that a laboring man that understands husbandry can in a short time save money enough to purchase a piece of new land sufficient for a plantation whereon he may subsist a family. Such are not afraid to marry, for if they even look far enough forward to consider how their children when grown up are to be provided for, they see that more land is to be had at rates equally easy, all circumstances considered. A question that deserves to be asked is whether he saw a time in the future when good land might not be available except at exorbitant prices, or the ownership of land became highly concentrated. At the end of the 19th century, historian Frederick Jackson Turner offered his own perspective on the influence of the frontier experience on the character of Americans, generally. Obviously, he was commenting on those Americans of European heritage. So long as free land exists, the opportunity for a competency exists, and economic power secures political power. In 1757, Franklin returned to London, where he was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws degree by the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Then in 1760, Oxford University awarded him an honorary Doctor of Civil Laws. His circle of contacts now included Adam Smith and David Hume. Franklin next wrote an essay on the relation between Britain and its colonies. In this essay, he emphasized the principle of the division of labor and offered an explanation of why the introduction of manufacturing is difficult where agriculture remains a profitable activity. He also observed that the broad ownership of property brings political stability. He wrote, While the government is mild and just, while well, important civil and religious rights are secure, such subjects will be dutiful and obedient. The waves do not rise but when the winds blow. In 1757, the Pennsylvania Assembly voted to impose taxes on all landowners in the colony, including the Penn family. Benjamin Franklin was enlisted to travel to London to defend the colony's decision. Several years of continuous effort failed to convince the king to curtail the authority of the Penn family over the colony, and Franklin returned to North America in August of 1762. He entered an exchange of correspondence with David Hume, the great philosopher and political economist. They discussed the virtues of America and exchanged views on scientific matters. Franklin then traveled to France for what he later wrote was one of the most sought-after meetings of his life with Francois Quesnay, leader of the French school of political economists known as physiocrats. Quesnay, court physician to Louis XV, contributed several articles to Diderot's Encyclopédie and began to develop his views on the responsibilities of government on the nature of property, and on the promotion of trade and commerce. Caney's own thinking was strongly influenced by Richard Cantillon's essay on the nature of commerce. Caney agreed with Cantillon on a key component of political economy from both a scientific and moral perspective. The land is the source or matter from whence all wealth is produced, and the labor of man is the form which produces it. A major contribution to political economy as a scientific endeavor was creation of the Tableau Economique, developed by Kene as the first serious attempt to inject quantitative analysis into the work of political economists. The physiocrats believed in natural law, 
as revealed by the application of scientific methods of analysis and observation. They argued that societies organized in accord with natural law would be both moral and prosperous. Man-made laws, they argued, must distinguish between the productive and non-productive segments of society. One of the central figures in the physiocratic school who later emigrated to the United States was Pierre Samuel Dupont de Nemours. Dupont edited the key physiocratic journal. Another leading physiocrat, Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, was appointed administrator of the province of Limoges in 1761, and five years later wrote a 100-page outline of political economy, supposedly written for two Chinese students prior to their return home. The physiocrats argued for minimal but appropriate governmental intervention in economic affairs, described by the phrase les affaires, les passer, which roughly translates to clear the way and leave things alone. Henry George later added this required a fair field with no favors. The physiocrats went on to advocate what they refer to as the impo unique, taxation that transferred to owners of land the responsibility to pay for the expenses of the sovereign, thus avoiding the onerous taxation of the peasants, workers, and actual cultivators of land. In 1767, Franklin produced an essay on the price of corn and management of the poor. This essay was published in the main physiocratic journal. In this essay, Franklin argued, The best way to do good is not making the poor easy in poverty, but leading or driving them out of it. The following year, 1768, Franklin produced the pamphlet Positions to be Examined Concerning National Wealth, in which he wrote, All food or substance for mankind arises from the earth or waters. There seem to be but three ways for a nation to acquire wealth. The first is by war, as the Romans did, and plundering their conquered neighbors. This is robbery. The second, by commerce, which is generally cheating. The third, by agriculture the only honest way wherein man receives a real increase of the seed thrown into the ground and a kind of continual miracle wrought by the hand of God in his favor as a reward for his innocent life and his virtuous industry. Franklin also learned a great deal by seeing firsthand how the oppressed actually lived. Ireland and Scotland provided important insights. Of those lands, he wrote, In those countries, a small part of society are landlords, great noblemen and gentlemen, extremely opulent, living in the highest affluence and magnificence, the bulk of the people tenants, living in the most sordid wretchedness in dirty hovels of mud and straw and clothed only in rags. The question for Franklin was, armed with this enlightened set of economic principles, what could he do? What he could do was continue to write, hoping his established reputation as a scientist would carry over into the realm of political economy. He had reached a point in his understanding of the causes of misery, wrote biographer Carl Van Dorn, where... The poverty and misery of the Irish people were an example of what might come to America if the old colonial system of exploitation were kept up. America must defend itself from such a future. America and Ireland had a common cause against England. Thomas Paine's pamphlet in support of the cause of the excisemen came to Franklin's attention and they eventually met. At Franklin's urging, and with letters of introduction he provided, Payne departed from England in November 1774 for British America. 
Payne later wrote to Franklin, Your countenancing me has obtained for me many friends and much reputation, for which please accept my sincere thanks. And later, Payne added, For my own part, I thought it very hard to have the country set on fire about my ears almost the moment I got into it. In 1774 in France, Francois Canet died. Then in mid-1776, Turgot was dismissed by King Louis XVI as demanded by the French landed aristocracy. But in 1774, Franklin, still representing colonial commercial interests in Britain, was called before the Privy Council to answer charges he passed on confidential government documents to the colonial leaders. Fearful of his situation, he left Britain early in 1775, arriving in Philadelphia on the 5th of May. Now back in Philadelphia, Franklin was chosen by the Pennsylvania Assembly as a deputy to the Second Continental Congress. He promptly submitted a proposal for Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union for debate. Payne put a draft of common sense before Franklin in late 1775. When finally printed, the first copy was delivered directly to Franklin. Now Franklin and others in the Congress had the enormous task ahead of finding the resources with which to conduct the war and the means with which to pay for them. Franklin wrote, The effective paper money is not understood on this side of the water. This currency, as we manage it, is a wonderful machine. It performs its office when we issue it. It pays and clothes troops and provides victuals and ammunition. And when we are obliged to issue a quantity excessive, it pays itself off by depreciation. Earlier, Franklin warned of the dangers of a depreciating paper currency and advanced several alternative measures to fund the war, all rejected as impractical. The colonies had almost no hard money in reserve. There was little else that could be done other than to issue paper currency into circulation. During the war, the British flooded their former colonies with huge amounts of counterfeit currency to undermine the ability of the Congress to function. Under the Articles of Confederation, the Congress did not possess the power to tax individuals or even enforce the requisition of materials from the states. Now in his 70s, Franklin agreed to make the arduous journey to France in an effort to secure French assistance. Interestingly, before being dismissed from his government office, Turgot had warned the king that supporting the American colonials against Britain would bankrupt France, causing serious social upheaval at home. Turgot was ignored and died in 1781, just as Franklin was asking for more and more assistance. With victory and independence, Franklin looked ahead to the future of the new United States. He authored a pamphlet titled, Information to Those Who Would Remove to America. He informed readers that the great advantage of America was its vast emptiness, a condition that would not last forever. This happy circumstance would continue, he observed, until the lands are taken up and cultivated, and the excess of people cannot get land with those coming from the old world had difficulty finding employment. Returning from Europe, he also learned that despite the war, his own lands had increased in value considerably during his long absence. His overall estate had tripled in value. Moreover, Georgia had also awarded him 3,000 acres of land for his services. 
Franklin also held the deed to a large tract of land in the Ohio Territory. Near the end of 1785, Thomas Paine raised the issue of currency in a pamphlet, Dissertations on Government, the Affairs of the Bank and Paper Money. He sent a copy to Franklin asking for any difficulties or doubtfulness that may occur to you. Franklin was hopeful for the future of the new nation, but his advanced age and deteriorating health prevented him from acting forcefully to advance his positions. In a letter to Alexander Small, Franklin wrote, I have not lost any of the principles of political economy you once knew me possessed of, but to get the bad customs of the country changed, and new ones, though better introduced, it is necessary first to remove the prejudices of the people, enlighten their ignorance, and convince them their interests will be promoted by the proposed change. And this is not the work of a day. Our legislators are all landholders, and they are not yet persuaded that all taxes are finally paid by the land. Therefore, we have been forced into the mode of indirect taxes, duties on importation of goods. In the end, he urged approval of the proposed Constitution, even though he was not fully satisfied with the document. During the convention, Franklin met informally with many delegates at his home, where he likely introduced them to the basic principles of physiocracy. To the extent his principles had a voice, that voice came from James Madison. Yet Madison understood that principle would need to be compromised in order to form a national government. Madison biographer Ralph Ketchum explains. Madison shared the ideals and high hopes of Jefferson's enlightened philosophy circle in Paris but his political tasks in the United States gave him a turn of mind inclined to dampen or amend Jefferson's speculations. Madison thought the unfortunate yet relentless way overpopulation caused human misery meant laws, though helpful, would never be able to abolish poverty. Likewise, the noble principle that the earth belonged to the living generation needed to be restrained and amended lest it upset vital and useful aids to order and stability. Madison was sincerely concerned about the influence of wealth on how government decides to raise needed revenue, writing in the Federalist. There is perhaps no legislative act in which greater opportunity and temptation are given to a predominant part to trample on the rules of justice. Where Franklin agreed with his physiocratic colleagues that land should be the source of public revenue, Alexander Hamilton argued very differently that with regard to the landed interest, particularly in relation to taxes, no tax can be laid on land which will not affect the proprietor of millions of acres as well as the proprietor of a single acre. Every landholder will therefore have a common interest to keep taxes on land as low as possible, and common interest may always be reckoned upon as the surest bond of sympathy. The story is told that as the delegates of the Constitutional Convention trudged out of Independence Hall on the 17th of December, 1787, an anxious woman in the crowd waiting at the entrance inquired of Franklin, Well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? To which Franklin replied, A republic, if you can keep it. And as Franklin realized, the new constitution was silent on the physiocratic principle that the land ought to bear the cost of government. 
a powerful obstacle to adoption of the physiocratic policy of the impo unique in the United States was identified by historian Charles Beard. Speculation in Western lands was one of the leading activities of capitalists in those days. Furthermore, large areas had been bought outright for a few cents an acre and were being held for a rise in value. Every leading capitalist of the time thoroughly understood the relation of a new constitution to the rise in land values beyond the Alleghenies. There was a huge, thinly populated continent to be subdued and brought into private hands. Few cared about the rightful claims of future generations. Benjamin Franklin died on April 17, 1790, at age 84. His funeral was attended by approximately 20,000 people. There are three quotes on the memorial plaque to Franklin, two from decades earlier by physiocratic colleagues. Mirabeau described him as the sage whom two worlds claimed as their own. Turgot had he tore from the skies the lightning and from tyrants the scepter. And finally, Franklin left future generations with this. They that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. When I began to write this story, I had some familiarity with Franklin's remarkable life, as I suspect is the case for most who are listening to this presentation. His adoption of physiocratic principles was likely for him quite similar to the experience many of us have had upon exposure to the principles contained in the writings of other great thinkers. All of a sudden, the world somehow makes sense. Thank you.